All right, good morning, everybody. You guys ready to worship? All right, the Bible says in Psalms 156, it says, Everybody that has breath, praise the Lord. Amen. That's us, right? We're breathing, we're moving. We give all the glory to God this morning. Thank you, Lord. There is a river that flows unrestrained from your heart. of mercy so deep I could never depart Father your wonders are endless open my eyes to believe awake my soul God is good, amen? amen? We worship you, Lord, this morning. Thank you, Father God. We love to worship you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. Put your hands together for him. He's worthy of our praise. church you know the bible in revelations it says that they continuously declare that he is holy 24 7 day after day night after night they declare the holiness of the lord that's in us right now we need to declare god you are holy and worthy lord we worship you this morning jesus hallelujah
Jesus is in this room Here I now, here I now Making this place I stand Holy ground, holy ground Your spirit moves and breathes All around, all around All good and perfect things Flowing down, flowing down Fall out the heavens are singing along with the saints and the elders In glory and song and the praise
Amen. Why don't we just, we're just joining the angels. That's what's going on 24 7. And why wait till we get to heaven? A matter of fact, one third of us is already there. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have your seats. We're going to partake of communion. What this song is singing is about the veil was torn from top to bottom. If anybody needs a communion element, please raise your hand and one will be brought to you. Here's a couple over here. Those of you that are watching online, please get a cracker or something that will represent the bread and juice, and please partake with us. This is so awesome. I love this song because when Jesus was on the cross, he had to wait till the time that the sacrifice was being made in the temple. At the same exact time, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. And the Bible says the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. You know that thing? It was very, very tall, and it was several inches thick, a lot of material, because it was the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest could go in there once a year. But we have a high priest that presented himself and the blood of the spotless lamb to the righteous judge, the Father. And the Father looked at that blood and said, acceptable for all time. Amen. We don't need a, another high priest. We have one seated at the right hand of God. And what's so beautiful, I'm going to read you a verse that proves that there, we're there with them already. It's in Ephesians 2, 5. It starts off, I quote this verse almost every day. It says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together, this is together with Christ, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You guys, this is why we're always talking about spirit and soul and body. My spirit is already saved. It's already one with God. It's seated at the right hand of God. See, Jesus came so much not to change our condition, but to change our position. We have been positioned in Christ in heavenly places. Amen. Seated at the right hand of God in the place of honor. Amen. Because he came to the lowest state of every sinner. That's the only way he could raise up the lowest of lowest sinners. When we accept him and we accept that blood sacrifice, that we could be seated at the right hand of God. And you guys, this is something so awesome. When you get a bad report or life challenges are coming and Jesus said that they would, that you look at it from a positional place of Christ has already overcome everything that will come against us in this world. Amen. And if you're seated at the right hand of God, we actually should look to the left because that's where the Father is. Isn't that so awesome? We just say, Father, I know that this has already been overcome, that we're coming from a place of victory, the cross. Amen. The Lord was showing me that this week because I was thinking about something, and he said, you're thinking wrong. <laughs> you need to think positionally. you already seated in Christ. We look at it as a perspective from heaven's viewpoint. Amen? Not from the earth, like God is somewhere out there far. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you because the king lives inside of us. So we carry the presence of God 24-7. And we start to see that, then our condition starts to change. Amen? That's renewing the mind. And that's the beauty of communion, to realize what the cross has accomplished for us. Something that we could not accomplish for ourselves. And they did it for us. Amen? They didn't need our help. That's why when you take what Jesus did and you try to add your works or add anything that you do or don't do, you just zeroed out the cross is 100% Jesus, amen, and then us putting our faith in that finished work, and then seeing that from that position, so beautiful, our condition starts to change, amen, that pain in your body, that bad report, that sickness, that hurt, that loss, it just starts to leave your body, amen, I'm telling you, it works, it is so awesome, but you just got to renew your mind, amen, that what Jesus did was more than enough. I kind of think of it this way because I love Costco. And, uh, and I think like God gave me my own Costco. And um, that uh, 
it's just me. I walk in and it's just my Costco and it's everything Costco would ever have from <laughs> beginning at Costco to the end of Costco. And that's God's provision for me. I can never use up everything that the cross has provided for me and neither can you. Anything that you need, it's already in you. Amen. And this is the power of the Holy Spirit. He's so awesome. He's with you to help you work it out. That's called abundant life, Zoe life. Amen. It lives on the inside of you. You have access to it 24-7. Amen. Even while you're sleeping. Amen. Even when you miss it, you still have access. Amen. If you have any sickness in your body, you've gotten a bad report, that's not the end of the story. You don't only have healing on the inside of you. You have the healer, and he's in perfect health. And 1 John 4, 17 says that as he is, so are we in this world. The resurrected Christ that's seated at the right hand of God, as he is, he's not sick. He's not depressed. He's not hurting. He's not sorrowful. Matter of fact, I had a friend that he's gone on to be with the Lord. Now he's a minister. He had a visit to heaven, and he said, all of heaven you hear the echo of God's laughter and he has a deep belly laugh because who's seated at his right hand and what he's accomplished for us. God is a happy camper. Amen. Nothing's ever going to change that. So why don't we join in? Amen. If you have any sickness in your body, we're just going to pronounce it to be gone. Amen. Any hurt, any pain, any sorrow. Amen. Any consciousness of sin. Jesus took all that on the cross. Amen. Just to liberate us, to set us free. Let's go ahead and break the bread and partake. And just thank the Lord for healing your body. Thank him for carrying that sorrow, that hurt, that burden. Amen. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he's borne our griefs and he's carried away our sorrows. Amen. Anything that's been purchased by the cross, it's wrong for you to claim it as your own. My sickness you know, my disease, my arthritis, well, that's actually a lie because Jesus paid for all that. It belongs to him. Amen. Let's honor the cross and what he's done. If you have any uh, condemnation, shame, guilt, Jesus bore that on the cross for you too, so you don't have to. Amen. You've been relieved of all that. That's not a part of the abundant life that he's died for us to have. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and partake of the juice and just believe in the clear conscience that Christ has paid for us. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for the gift of the cross. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say, our good God has done good things and great things are still to come in Jesus' name. Now give him a big hand clap of praise this morning for being so good to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. He's healed our bodies. He's forgiven us of our sin. You know, as Sister Mary was saying how throughout all of heaven you can hear the laughter of God and the echoes of his laughter. I started thinking about, have you ever known someone who received the best news of their entire life and then you said nothing can nothing can can put them in a bad mood mood now ever have you ever been in that that mood before where you've received some good news or something happened to you where nothing could ruin your mood nothing could take that joy away anyone well that's that's god all the time that his son accomplished what he was set out to do and restored all of mankind back to himself. That was some good news for God, amen? And now he's happy and nothing can take him out of that mood. God's not mad. He's not angry with people. He's not striking down people. He's, listen, he's not even sad. God's a happy God, a very happy God. And he sees the good things in you. He doesn't see the bad things. He doesn't see what you're struggling with. He, not in the sense where he ignores you and doesn't help you. He doesn't see that and count it towards you. He doesn't see that as who you are. He wipes that away. He offers you the help. But for him, his relation to you, it's like it doesn't exist. He just loves you. That's some good news, amen? Thank you, Lord. Well, hey, it's offering time this morning.
We've got a couple excited people here in the room. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to, to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. You know, you ought to read your Bible sometimes. It's some good stuff in there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is writing to the church of Corinth, and he's talking about their ministry. Who wants a ministry in their life? You don't have to be on stage. You don't have to, to do worship. You don't have to preach. But you can still have a ministry off the stage. Amen? And Paul was writing to the church of Corinth, Corinth to the people about this ministry that they've been doing. And he says in verse 1, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. So they're doing some pretty cool stuff in the ministry to stir up these people, right? Paul's saying, man, I see your willingness. I see your readiness. You, you were ready for, for the Macedonians. Your zeal has stirred up the majority of people. He's talking about their ministry. It says, yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that I said you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. What's the ministry he's talking about? The ministry of giving. Every single one of us, whether you're a pastor, whether you've just become a Christian, whether you play in the worship band, whether you're helping with the kids ministry, every Christian alive has a ministry. And we all have one common ministry. We have multiple common ministries. But one of the common ministries that we have as a body of Christ is our ministering of the gift. Our ministry of generosity. That is one of the most important ministries that the body of, of, of believers shouldn't forsake. Amen? And he said, he said man, I, I am boasting about you guys. Not because of how much you're giving, but because of your readiness and because of your willingness and your preparedness. Now, sometimes we might come to church and then offering time comes along and the offering bucket get passed and, and we're just scrambling to, to get something out and we just throw it in the bucket and we call it good. But he was boasting about their preparedness, their readiness. In other words, Regardless of, of what was happening, they knew our, ahead of time, we are going to give. That's just what we've established. We are going to give. It's not a question. They don't even have to ask. If there's no offering time, we're still going to give. They had a prepared heart to give. And not just a, a heart to give, but a willingness. He said, not just in a grudging obligation, but as the matter of generosity. He goes on in verse 6 to say, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And here's the catch. So let each one gives as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly, not of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Paul did not say, wait for the Lord to tell you how much to give, then give it. He said, as you've already purposed in your heart, give. What we can do, and, and what I've done in the past, is, is I can get to a place where I don't give until the Lord tells me to give. Now, I'm not saying not to do that. 
There is wisdom and discernment as to where and when to give. If you're just giving to give to a church that has no power and to a ministry that has no life and, and there's nothing working in there and they're forcing you to give and they're, they're guilting you to give, I would say don't give. God would say don't give. Because we should never give under impulsion, under guilt, under condemnation. We should never give out of obligation. Always as a cheerful gift, a generous gift out of the, the willingness of our own heart. Amen? Amen? And that's what we preach. I, we don't want your offering if it's of a grudging heart. We don't want you to give if it's because you feel like I guilted you into giving. Keep it. You're better off with it than you are without it. But when you give with a cheerful heart and you give because you want to, that's a ministry. I mean, how many of you know, I, I could be doing, we could be doing the ministry right now, but our hearts aren't in it for the right things. Would that be an effective ministry? No. I could say all the right things, do all the right things, take all the nice pictures of, of me shaking people's hand and, and telling them, oh, we love you, hope to see you again soon. But in my heart, if I hated everyone, would that be an effective ministry? No. And the same thing with our gift. If you're just giving because it's a, a have to, because, because you're forced to, because it's the right thing to do, is it an effective gift? Is it an effective ministry? Mm -mm. See, God's not so much concerned with the quantity of, of how we do things, but he's more concerned of the quality. He, he could, there's churches that have five people and God's blessed with that because the five people there love God and they love the church and, and, and God loves their heart. And there's thousands of people in a church that sadly God's not blessed by it because of the heart the differences in the heart so as we give as we present our offerings before the Lord go before him and check your heart say Lord am I giving out of compulsion am I giving because I have to or am I giving because number one I know your promise I know your word is true he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. Do I know that, that this offering of, of generosity truly blesses you? Or am I just doing this because I have to? Because if I don't, then the, then the offering bucket passes by and I don't put something in there, people are going to judge me. So you got to watch your motive as to when and why you do something. Not just with giving, everything. Amen? It doesn't just stop here. It stops everywhere. It, it continues to go throughout your life. But then Paul goes, goes on and he says this. He says in verse 8, And God is able. Someone say, God is able. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you sometimes having a little bit of sufficiency... In some things you... Am I reading that right? All grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. See, God's not going to leave you out to dry when you give. He takes care of His children. Amen? Amen? He cares for us. He loves us. And I can guarantee you, you are way better off with, with the money you have left over after you give than you are with all of the money you have. He will take care of you so much more than you can take care of you. But we have to learn how to trust Him with that. We have to say, Lord, I budget and I make sure we track our finances and we track our spending, but... I still need to trust you with all of it. That's being a good steward. Being a good steward of it is, is budgeting, is making sure you're not frugally spending it on things you don't need, and making sure that you, you're, you're, you're living within your means. That's being a good steward. 
But just because you're a good steward does not mean that you stop trusting God for the provision. And the way we can trust him is by saying, Lord, I'm giving it back to you. I'm, I'm trusting that you provide more than what I can make on my own. Amen? But when we hold on to it, Proverbs says, there's one who holds on to more than is right and it leads to poverty. But there's one who scatters and yet he increases more. It's a principle of the word. It's a principle of God's laws, his spiritual laws operating in this life. But notice it said this. He says, all grace will abound towards you. So you have all sufficiency in all things and you'll have an abundance for every good work. See, what people think this says is if I give, I'll have money to do whatever I want. If it's not a good work, don't expect the provision for it. If, if you're trying to have faith for something that's not a good work, who is it going to be coming from if God's not going to provide it? Do you want that? See, it's, it's the purpose is for every good work. It's so that you can continue to be a blessing. The people here in Corinth were continuing to be a blessing. So much so that Paul was boasting in their readiness to give. He knew, man, they have an offering prepared three months in advance. They were ready. They were eager. It wasn't a second thought. It wasn't a let's check our account and then let's see how much we give. It was more of a let's give and then see what we have left off. That was their heart. That was their intention. And I can guarantee you, from my Father in heaven, that when you have a heart that is ready and willing to give, regardless of the amount. See, sometimes I feel like we need to, I just want to reach in your head and, and take that where it says it has to be this much and just throw it away. Regardless of the amount, have a willing heart and a readiness to give. Amen. It blesses me when the Sprout kids here at this church give two dollars. I've we've seen it. They've given cents, pennies, nickels, quarters, whatever they have. And it's just like, man, that's a blessed kid. Because they're learning the the basic principle of learning to trust God with, with something they were given. Something that, and guess what? The next time offering comes around, they give again. So God's providing somehow. They still have something to give. And if, if a child can learn how to do that, it's, it's easy for children. It's harder for us adults. It's harder for, for you when you work eight to five, Monday through Friday. And then you get that check every other week. It's harder for us to let go after we've said, I worked for this. This is mine. I earned it. I want to spend it on what I want to spend it on. Much easier for a child when, when mama and daddy gives them $5 and then says, now give some of that to the offering. They don't know anything. They, don't, they didn't work for that, right? But we need to adopt this, that childlike faith that being a, a little child again seeing although I worked sure God's the one who provided it God's the one who gave me the job in the first place God's the one who gave me the hours God's the one who blessed me with the boss God's the one who provided in the first place he's the source because regardless of the job if you left that job God's still going to provide through another source Money does not grow on trees. Money doesn't fall from the sky. God uses people and sources to provide for you. Amen? So regardless of where the money comes from, if you worked for it or if it was given to you, God supplied. If we go on, he says over in verse 10, it says, Now may he who supplies the seed to the sower... And bread for food, supply, and not just supply, multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. 
while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, meaning for freedom, financial freedom, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For this administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but it also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. You're not just ministering to each other. You're ministering to God. And you're, there's many thanksgivings abounding unto God. And it says, while through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with all men. See, it, it goes so much further than you. If you can get past you, you're in luck. If you can get past you, you've hit success. Amen? It's not about you. There's a promise, there's a promise, there's a promise that God will give back to you and increase your fruits of, of righteousness. But it's not about you. That's just the promise. And once you understand that, it impacts so many more people. It impacts that person who, who might be struggling and all of a sudden they need this much money and you give them the exact dollar amount. That'll bless someone. And that'll cause thanksgiving to God. Even if they don't even believe in God, they'll say, oh my, thank you, God, oh my. Never heard an atheist say, oh my God. I don't believe in him. Why are they saying his name? When you give a good gift to someone that causes them to say thank you for God, you've done a ministry. You've done an excellent service, the Bible says. So don't hold back. Don't withhold like the Bible says more than is right. Because God always blesses us for every good work to enrich us in everything, he says. If you don't like the prosperity gospel, just rip out 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Take it out. Then you'll be like most churches who don't believe the whole Bible. But if you understood that this obedience will cause thanksgiving for other people, it'll cause other people to say, thank you God they might thank you they might say hey Rick thanks so much buddy but they're not thanking you you know that it's not you that they're thanking it's God because God gave the provision he'll give seed to the sower and he'll multiply the seed God's so good he'll still give bread for the person who only eats the seed it says he will increase the seed sown now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Those are two different people. He supplies seed for the one who gives, but he'll still supply food for the one who doesn't give. For the one who just has enough for themselves. He'll still supply the food because he's a good God. But when you start giving, then he supplies the seed for the sower. Then he'll say, he'll, he'll start increasing that seed and multiplying that seed so you can start giving more and more and more. There's a minister that I know and I love and he was out shopping at the mall one of these days and he had tens of thousands of dollars with him. And he was at the mall and he reached into his money bag and gave a woman $10,000 to go shopping. Imagine doing that. Imagine having that much money just to go here. Here's $10,000. Go buy whatever you want in the mall today. Some of y'all don't want to be blessed. Don't come to me when I got that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God is a good God. He wants you to succeed. And he wants others to succeed. But we have to understand that this ministry of giving has to come from a ready a willing and a generous heart. Amen? Why don't we stand this morning as we bless the offering? There's a couple ways to give if you're giving today. Um, if you're watching online, you can give at deeprooted.church slash give, or you can text to give to uh, the number, uh, or text any dollar amount to the number 84321. If you're giving in person, there's the offering envelopes in the seats in front of you. Cast or check or credit card giving is available both online and in person if you'd like to give that way. Hold your offering in the air as we bless it this morning.
Father God, we just thank you for every gift today, and we thank you for every giver. Well, we call these seeds sown blessed in Jesus' name, like your word says, to increase the fruit of our righteousness, to increase the seeds to the sower, Father, so we can be a bigger blessing to a lot more people. Lord, we believe that you give us the provision, you give us the seeds to sow, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Let's say this together. Something good will happen today because he is good and his mercy endures forever. I will have abundance, all sufficiency, and more than enough because he is good and his mercy endures forever. He is my shepherd, I shall not want, because he is good and his mercy endures forever. Shout it, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, because he is good and his mercy endures forever. Ushers wait on the Open people. The eyes of my heart, Lord. Give the Lord one more hand clap of praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy. Well, good morning, good morning. Before you sit down, why don't you greet your neighbor and then you can be seated. Well, good morning, Deep Rooted Church. You happy to be here this morning? Come on, let's hear it. You happy to be here today? Thank you, Lord. He is good to us. Amen. Has he been good to you? If he has not been good to you, just do this. And then say, thank you, Lord. Because he's been good to everyone who has breath. Even to those who don't believe, he's been good to them. Thank you, Lord. Hey, who was here for our night of worship on Wednesday night? And if you enjoyed it, it was such a good, a good night of worship. And um, it was a, a real blessing for us to be, be doing that and to give that for, for our church and uh, be expecting another one within the year. We, we want to do them quarterly. So um, we'll, we'll be planning for the next quarter to, to do another one. Small groups have concluded. Not this past Wednesday, but the Wednesday before. So our small groups are on pause for the, for the time being until the next season. Um, we have to meet with our small group leaders and, and start getting ready for the next season. So once that's getting close, we'll start announcing it weeks before they, they start. That way you can, under, you can know um, when they're starting and you can 
free up your schedule if you do want to be a part of those. They're such a great, a great time to be together. I, like Paul was boasting, I'm boasting in our men's group, man. That, that men's group, and I'm not joking, is awesome. Usually a church that does a small group has like three men showing up to it. Ours is like 10 to 12 average every single week. So it's just been a big blessing seeing our men be really awesome leaders in the Lord. And we're just proud of you guys. And Father's Day is coming up. So we want to make sure you guys are here for that. When is it? Next weekend? Yeah, next weekend's Father's Day. So we'd love for you guys to be here. I'm going to say this live now. So we have to do it. Um, I want us to do some root beer floats at the end of service at the uh, next weekend. So be here, get a root beer float. Um, Cause dads like root beer, and uh, it's, it's the Christian beer. So we'll, we'll have some root beer for all the guys uh, out in the in the lobby after service. If you guys want to have that, um, bring your dads to church. I think it'll be a, a good time in fellowship with each other. So. Other than that, we have one more announcement, and that's in July 14th through the 16th. Our good friend Arthur Menchez will be coming, and he'll be preaching for three days, so a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday. You're not going to want to miss it. Um, If you have plans, reschedule them and come join us because it's going to be a great, great time. He is an anointed speaker, especially on the grace of God, and um, I, I, I think I preach pretty good on the grace of God, but... He, he's like on steroids with that. It's awesome. So if you want to come and, and experience a good three-day weekend of, of, of the word and the grace of the Lord, come here and, and hear uh, Mr. Arthur Manchez. I believe it will bless you tremendously. Amen? Amen? Who's ready for the word today? All right, before we get started, can we give our online audience one big, deep round of applause? Thank you guys for, for tuning in. If you're ever in the area, we invite you to come down here to Deep Rooted Church and meet some of our awesome people. I believe they're the finest people here in all of Visalia, California. Amen? Well, thank you guys for being here today. I hope that you get something good out of the word today. Um, we're continuing the series that we've been in about emotions. And we kind of took a detour in emotions and we've been focusing on joy, remaining in joy. And how do we stay positive in in this world that that's filled with negativity um i was just watching tv i wasn't even watching the news i was watching tv the other day and a commercial for the news came on and just in that 30 second slot i got depressed just listening to the news and they what they did was they said tune in to whatever whatever news um and they had these like top headline stories that said Listen to how all about all these stories that affect people and you. And the headline, I was like, how, how does that affect me? It was like someone got shot or stabbed in a neighborhood. I'm like, how does that affect me? I don't even live in that neighborhood. I don't even know those people. And it started, I got, started thinking about how literally everything nowadays, especially the news, is, is pointing you to destruction and death and and there's no goodness in it you know the news used to be just telling you facts and current events and and things that that are that's happening around the world and now it's just telling you horror stories it's just telling you horrible things that are happening it's not even news anymore and and it's just become so depressing to listen to and there was this bumper sticker one time and it said, if you aren't depressed, it's because you're not paying attention. Mm-hmm. And it just goes to show how depressing the world is and everything in it. And that's why a lot of people they, who are in the world, they flock to the church because they're looking for something good. They're looking for that diamond in the rough. They're looking for something that can offer them joy, something in this world that can offer them peace and and sometimes they go to their own vices at work for a moment, but they're right back into the same situation. But other times they find the church and they find a good church and they find this church and they know there's something more than this life that I'm living right now. As a Christian, I even ask that question. There has to be more than just what I'm experiencing 
right now. I'm just as, de- as tired as the world. I'm just as depressed as the world. I'm just as sick. There has to be something more. There's a lot of people asking that question, even in the body of Christ. How do I stay positive in a negative world? How do I keep the outside factors from affecting me inwardly? Remember I gave you that airplane analogy, that when an airplane goes up into the atmosphere, up there the the pressure and and the way that the atmosphere works and the, the, the pressure of space, without the proper tools, that plane would get crushed. That tube of metal would get crushed, but it doesn't because inside the cabin there's pressure and it's pressure pushing out while there's pressure pushing in and it stabilizes it and it keeps it um, it keeps the structure of the plane sturdy and so with our life there is constant pressures pressures from our workplace pressures from the devil pressures from friends pressures from from current events there's always pressure in this world that's going to try to crush you But we have something on the inside that's greater and that causes us to put pressure back on things, keeping us intact. Amen. Jesus was in the garden the night of his crucifixion and he was in in the garden of, of, of Gethsemane, which is the olive press. The olive press. And he was in this, this state of turmoil and this state of, of, I mean, you think you've had it bad? Just wait until you start sweating drops of blood. It, he was going through it. And the Bible says he was crushed under the weight of what he was about to do. And you have to understand, Jesus did certain things so that we would never have to go through that. Amen. Amen. There are other things that he did so we can do, but he did the crushing. He went through the pressing. He went through the the turmoil of the garden so that we could have this power putting pressure back out. Amen? We don't have to be crushed by the world. We don't have to crumble whenever the world puts pressure on us. We can remain positive and we can remain in joy. And so we've been talking about Romans chapter 1, and this is where we've been staying, and and this is where it stemmed from. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, talking about God, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. So what was the first thing we talked about? To stay positive in a negative world? How do we remain in this state of positivity, in this this state of joy when the world's putting pressure on us? We glorify him. This is a a progressive list of steps that, that people take before they become to this place where they have no more conscience of God, they have no more discernment of, of right and wrong, they become this hardened heart, therefore they cannot receive the things of God anymore. And I believe if we reverse the steps, if we do the opposite of these steps of, of leading us to a path away from God, we can remain in the fullness of God. Amen. We can remain in the joy. Jesus said, I'm leaving my joy with you so that your joy would remain, meaning to continue. So I believe if we do the the opposite of these things, that'll enable our joy to continue. Going on, he says, they did not glorify glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. So what do we have to do next? Remain thankful. Even when things look tough, there is still something to be thankful about. Even when we can't see the end of the, of the tunnel, there's still something to be thankful about. There's always something that God's trying to do in our life, no matter the circumstances, for us to focus on and say, Lord, thank you for protecting me from this. Lord, thank you for keeping me from this. Thank you, Lord. Even, even in the story of Job, people go to that story, they flock to that story to try to cope with their life circumstances. And they try to see, say, well, look at all the things that, that Satan did to Job. Yeah, but at the beginning of the story, Satan went to God and said, I can't touch him. There's a hedge of protection around him. 
meaning God's been protecting them all of your life. God's been protecting you all of your life. And even the little things that came through, thank God for the hedge that kept the the big things out. Amen? Amen? There's always something to be thankful about, even if you're thankful for what God's taken you out of, if you're thankful for what he's already done for you, and being thankful for what he's going to do. It's called faith. Amen? So now we're moving on to the third one. It says, they became futile in their thoughts. The King James Version says, they became vain in their imagination. They became vain in their imagination. What does that look like? What does it mean to become vain in your imagination? It doesn't just mean thinking dirty thoughts. It doesn't mean thinking about something that you shouldn't be thinking of. Being vain in your imagination means that your imagination is no no longer working for you. It's working against you. Here's something you probably never thought of. Your imagination does not have a neutral to it. It's either working for you or it's working against you. There is no middle ground. It doesn't go on standby. It's not idling until you decide for it to work. It's either going to work for you or it's going to work against you. And if you don't understand that, chances are it's working against you. If you don't know how, that you can decide how, what it does, it's probably working against you. In fact, the Bible talks about this, this word imagination. It mentions imaginations two times imagination one time and imagine one time in the whole bible and every single time it's referencing imagination it's in a negative way it's in a a a way that that led to destruction a way that was vain and so the bible even connotates imagination as a negative thing in the bible in their in its context because they weren't using it for their advantage they weren't using it for the good. I believe your imagination is just, it's your thoughts, it's your will to do something, it's future things that haven't even happened, it's being able to think and conceive something in your mind. That's how Disneyland was created, regardless how you feel about that place. Disneyland was created in Walt Disney's mind, his imagination. He imagined it and boom, that's what happened. Nothing can happen in this world without you first thinking about it. Newsflash, you don't just cheat on your spouse out of the blue. You thought about it, and it came to pass. You don't see things happen without it happening in your imagination first. If you're writing this down, write down this first point. You have to understand the power of your imagination. Understand the power of your of your imagination we dealt with this a little bit during um one a couple of our series our our mind renovation life transformation series we dealt with it there Um, we dealt with it a few weeks back i was talking about um, your imagination and and really because your the your mind your imagination that is one of the most if not the most powerful tool we have on this planet It's more powerful than any book. It's more powerful than money. It's more powerful than people. Your imagination is the most powerful thing on this earth. And I'll prove it to you. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we read this last week. Peter said, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. We were talking about how you have to have a memory to be thankful for what God's done for you in the past. Without remembering what God's done for you, you can't be thankful for what he's done. You have to remember what he's done. And remembering takes place where? In your mind. You have to think about it. If I asked all of you to close your eyes right now, and actually, let's do this. Everyone close your eyes. Let's do this little exercise today. Now, if I said think of a dog, I'm sure all of you guys are thinking of a dog that you know, a dog that you've seen, 
a dog you've petted, a dog that, that's in your life to some degree. You're thinking of that dog. Now, if I said think of a, a big black Labrador, every one of you is thinking of a Labrador. But before, you were thinking of many different dogs because I didn't specify which dog it was. You used your imagination to think of that dog. Now, now think of a Supra box. You probably have no idea what that even looks like. You can't even imagine that because you have no idea what it is. See, I know what that is because it's a real estate thing. It's a little box that you put on a door and it keeps all the keys in there so people can access it and enter it. It's a super lock box. But the point was when you thought of a dog, you can open your eyes now. <laughs> lest you fall asleep. When you thought of that first dog, I can guarantee you, your dog was different than your dog. Guaranteed. But the moment I said a black Labrador, what happened? You guys thought of a black Labrador because you're thinking about what was spoken. You're thinking about what's happening. It's your imagination. Now, Peter, he stirred them up by reminding them everything that God's done for them. Reminding them by way of remembrance and stirring up their faith. But that takes place in your imagination. In, in, in the, this translation of, of, of Peter writing that he stirred up their minds, that word mind is translated imagination, and that word is also can be used as conception. That the mind is the place of conception. It's the spiritual womb where things are birthed from. Again, nothing that you can do in this life is possible without you first thinking you can do it. And there's proof to that because there are people who, who can't do a simple task because in their mind, they don't believe they can do it. There's this guy who grew up with a really harsh dad and his dad told him over and over again, uh, he would like work on screws and, and nuts and bolts and stuff. And whenever he would try to, to put on a, a screw, he would always uh, cross thread it. And so his dad would harp on him and tell him, you're never going to get this right. You're always cross-threaded. You're, you're never going to be able to screw this in. And for his whole life, he could never screw in a single thing because he would always cross-thread it. His dad put this mentality of you can never do it, so he never saw himself doing it. And be, How easy is it to thread something on? Easy. Even if you cross-thread it, just unscrew it and screw it back in. It's easy. But because he never could see himself doing it, He never did it. Until you can imagine things to happen, you'll never see it happen. There was a woman who was praying, uh, came up for prayer, and she was asking for healing in her eyes as she was blind. And the, the minister, he prayed over her, and after he was done praying, he asked her, can you see or what do you see? And she opened her eyes and said nothing. And he said, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. Close your eyes. And so she closed her eyes, and he prayed over her again. He said, what do you see? And she opened her eyes and said, nothing. And he said, close your eyes. I didn't tell you to open them. And he prayed for her again and said, what do you see? And she opened her eyes again and said, nothing. And she's like, how am I supposed to be able to see if I can't open my eyes? And he told her, you have to see in your heart first before you can see in the natural he prayed for her one more time, said, close your eyes. She closed them, and he prayed and said, what do you see? And she said, I see trees, and I see clouds, and I see this, and I see that. And he said, now open your eyes. And she opened them, and she was healed. So you, you have to conceive in your heart before you see it in the natural. It's conception. And everything that conceives comes to, to fruition. Everything that you think of, the Bible says... He says, as you think in your heart, so shall you be. However you're thinking, that's the way your life's going to go. So there is power in your imagination. You have to be able to understand and use your imagination for you. Otherwise, it's always going to work against you. I'll give you a reason why 
your imagination is, def- is its default setup is against you. Want to know what it is? When you feel a symptom or you see something happening and you're worrying and you start to Google it, you just gave yourself a death sentence pretty much. Anyone ever done that before? Or you Googled something and and then you started worrying, oh my goodness, what happens if this happens? And, and what happens, if, what if this is true? And what if I'm dealing with this? And now this is going to happen. Oh my gosh, if I have this, then I'm going to die. What are you doing? You're using your imagination. Because it's not actually happening to you. You're imagining it happening. So just by default, your imagination is, is, is trying to work against you. That's why it's so important that we have to renew our thinking, renew our mind. In Genesis chapter 11, the Bible says in verse 6, this was the people um, building this giant tower called Babel. And they tried to reach the heavens and, and get to the Lord and, and do it in their own strength, and the Lord wasn't pleased by it. And he said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. This is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. The King James says, nothing that they've imagined to do will be restrained from them. Imagination. These people were so in one accord with each other to build this tower to reach the heavens, which is physically impossible, and they were so determined. They all imagined to do this. And God said, nothing that they imagine to do will be refrained from them. In other words, there's nothing I can do about it. Their imagination is so powerful, I have to stop them somehow. And so God, he distributed all their, to all of them different languages. And so they couldn't understand each other anymore. And, and then they were scattered ab- abroad so that they couldn't work together. They didn't understand what to do. God was threatened by mankind's imagination. That's how powerful it is. Even God, almighty God said, "Uh uh-oh, we got to do something about this. Because their imagination, nothing will be withheld from what they imagined to do. That's powerful. You have to understand the power of it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 in the King James, it says this, For we walk after the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. What does that mean? It means though we're living in this world, we're living in the natural, we're living in carnal realities, we don't war after this natural flesh. We don't war after natural circumstances. If someone comes against me and argues with me and tells me that I'm some hypocrite and I'm this false preacher, I'm not warring against that person I'm not going to fight them because it's a spiritual battle. It's something that's taken place in a spiritual reality, not here in the flesh. And then he says this, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. In other words, if you're using carnal weapons, they're not as mighty as these weapons. These weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Do you know what a stronghold is? A stronghold is a, is a thing in someone's mind that they run behind for protection. It's when people put up a wall. You ever talk to someone before and addressed an issue or a concern in their life and, and you try to talk to them nicely and controlled and have a good conversation to fix the problem, but then that person just puts up a wall and gets angry? Yeah. Are you that person? <laughs> That's a stronghold. It's, it's, it's a place that, in your mind, you've already put that defense mechanism up, and so you run behind that. You run behind your preconceived ideas in your mind. It's a stronghold. And the Bible says that our weapons that we use to, to war pulls down those strongholds. I see it in the church all the time. I'll meet these awesome people, amazing people for the Lord, pastors. There's a a pastor friend of mine that I love, and he's a great, great man of God. But the moment we start talking about faith, the moment we start talking about prosperity, the moment we start talking about healing, 
He puts up a wall and says, oh, wait, wait, no, 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 that's not right. That's, that's not right because this happened in my life. So the word's not true. That's what they're saying. And he says, and they, they put up these walls of defense. And no, no matter what you say, they have this fortress, this stronghold that they hide behind so that they don't get offended or so that they don't experience hurt because they once tried it before and it didn't work. So I'm going to protect myself now. That's a stronghold. And the Bible says we have weapons to pull them down. In other words, we're not, we're not forcing them to believe it, but we're breaking down those barriers one by one by one. How do we do that? By demonstrating the power of God. These are the weapons we have. Then the next one, it says this, the next verse, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So the weapons of our warfare, they pull down strongholds, they help others see the truth. But the second thing they do is they cast down imaginations. This is one of the instances I was talking about where imagination is used negatively. We cast down imaginations, but not just that. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We cast them down. Both of those things are those, those weapons that we use cast down two things. The imaginations and all the thing that exalts, everything that exalts itself against God. Those two things are areas in our mind. They deal with our mind. The battle is not outwardly. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We're not wrestling with each other. We're dealing with a spiritual battle right between these. You don't have to cast out the demons and, and, and pray and, and ask for God to rend the heavens and to pour down a bless. All you need to do is fight this battle here first. Just worry about what's happening here. Don't worry about anything else. Don't worry about what so-and-so said. Don't worry about what you heard. Don't worry about the judgment. Don't worry about anything else but in between here. Because that's where the battle is. And if the devil can tell you, nope, it's not there. It's out here. Fight people. You've lost. You've, you've lost the battle. You've lost the war. Because the battle is not with people. The battle is not with ex external things. The battle is in between your ears. It's in your mind. And so if you can understand that we've been given these weapons to cast down bad imaginations, vain thoughts, thoughts that exalt themselves over God. I'll give you an example. You go to the doctor. You're not feeling well. The doctor says, boom, you have cancer. You start thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. There's nothing that's going to happen. What do I do? That thought immediately exalted itself over God because God said, I heal all things. I am your healer. Anything you come to me for has already been done on the cross. That report says, I don't care about your God. This is your reality. It exalted itself above God. So what's your job? You cast it down. You pull it down. You say, nope, thought, get behind me. Jesus even told the disciple, get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me. You tell those vain imaginations where they need to go. It says pulling them down under obedience to Christ. If those thoughts aren't obeying what God said, they don't belong in your mind. And you can't control what a, when a thought comes, but you can control how long it stays. You can't control if a bird flies over your head, but you can control if it builds a nest on your head. You don't have to let it do that. And with every thought that comes, it says every thought, bring it under obedience to the Lord. You have that power to decide how long a thought stays. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. In James chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted 
Say each one. Each one is tempted. Say I am. I am tempted when I am drawn away by my own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, where does desire conceive at? In the mind. Where does the desires live? In your heart, your mind, in your knower, in your thinker. That's where it lives. You don't desire. I mean, you, 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 you desire in the mind. That's where you desire. It says, when I've been drawn away from my desires and I'm enticed, that's when I'm tempted. Then, when desire is conceived, it gives birth. Now, it says it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Now, let's, let's, let's put it into a different perspective. Let's put fear into this. Not sin. This is talking about when you've been tempted by something evil and then you fall into sin. But let's, let's throw in fear, like that report I was talking about. You go to the doctor, the doctor says this, boom. Once you believe the report of the doctor, fear enters in. You haven't been drawn away by your own lusts and desires. You don't desire the symptom. You don't desire the report. But what has been, what drawed you away was the fear. And when the fear enticed you, you fell into fear, just like you fall into, temp, into sin. You fell into fear. And when fear is conceived, something is birthed from it. See, fear, just like sin, fear, every emotion that you'll ever experience is conceived at some point in your mind. Everything. So if you want to remain in joy... You, you can't, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be blunt. You can't have sex with fear if you want to give birth to joy. You have to have joy conceived in the mind to, con, to birth joy. But when you have fear being conceived in your mind over and over again, how do I do that? By watching the stupid news. By watching what the world's putting out. By listening to so-and-so who's not even a believer tell you about all these symptoms. By getting all the garbage in your mind. You're conceiving fear over and over and over again. What do you expect is going to be birthed at the end of this? You'll have a quadruplets of fear. How do you reverse it? Conceive something better. Sin conceives in the heart. Fear conceives in the heart. Joy conceives in the heart. Faith conceives in the heart see everything that you have that you are birthing everything you're experiencing proverbs says as he thinks in his heart so is he there's power in your imagination and you have control over it man how good is our god for giving you control over this crazy power say i'm i'm gonna make you and I'm going to make you with this part in your brain that thinks. I'm going to put that in you. And then I'm going to give you power to control it. (laughs) Whatever you do with it, that's up to you. You can use it for good. You can use it for bad. But I'm going to give you control over your mind. The Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. We can control what we think about. Has anyone ever told you that before? You can control what you think about. Isaiah says, he will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him. If your mind's not on him, it's because you don't trust on him. And because you don't trust him, there's no peace. You want to stay in joy? You got to keep your eyes on him. You got to get every high thing that exalts itself against God, bring it down underneath obedience to the Lord, and put back into its place the Word of God where it needs to be in your life. Thank you, Lord. The definition for imagination is the act or power of forming a mental image of something not present to the senses or never before wholly perceived in reality. 
I go back to that dog illustration. You guys thought of a dog in your mind at some point. It wasn't here. Did you see a dog barking around? No. But in your mind, you perceived something that was not present, right? Well, every single thing that fear tries to tell you is real, if you took a step back and looked at everything from a different perspective, you'd realize it's not even here. What, what fear is trying to present as real isn't even a reality. It's, it's a what if. It's a maybe this happens in the future. We don't take risks because we're afraid of what could happen. That's thinking of something that's not actually here. It's thinking of something that's, that's made up in your mind. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Are you receiving something today? If you're still taking notes, write this down. You need hope. You need hope. Romans 8, chapter 24, says, or Romans chapter 8, verse 24 says, We are saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. I believe hope is the Bible's way of, of defining a positive imagination. A positive. Remember, every, pretty much every instance of imagination in the Bible is referring to something bad. We cast down imaginations, vain imaginations. But with this, it's saying we're hoping, we're saved by this hope. But a hope that we see, why do we hope for it? It's right here. You don't have to imagine it. But what you, ha you have to imagine a hope that you cannot see, right? The hope that oh, I can't wait to get to heaven. I can't wait to see God Almighty in his glory. I can't wait to, to be in heaven and see all these people and, and, and talk to Abraham and talk to Moses and talk to all the great men and women of faith in the Bible. I can't wait. I can't see them right now, so I hope for that. It's using my imagination. But I, I can't hope for something that's right here. Because it's here. Why do you have to hope for it? So I believe that's, that's a positive imagination. Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Another translation says, Faith is the confidence, the assurance, the title deed to things hoped hoped for the evidence of things not seen again it's, it's dealing with this this reality that it's not here right now i cannot see it but i believe it's there it's hope it's a positive imagination mm. hope isn't just wishing hope is actually believing it says faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, if you hope for something, faith has to accompany it. If you're hoping to see your healing, faith needs to accompany it. Faith is the substance of that hope, meaning it's, 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 it's what makes the things you hope for actually come to pass. The things that you imagine in your head, you can't just imagine, well, oh, I can see myself healed, but... I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm not going to believe for it. I can see, but I'm not going to I'm not going to renew my mind to it. I'm not going to do any of that. It faith needs to accompany hope. They need to come together. Number 3, keep your mind on Jesus. I read this earlier and you can read it on the screen. Isaiah 26:3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. How do you do that? How do you keep your mind stayed on him? How do you keep your focus on him and not on everything else? He's not here. We can't see him. We can't talk to him. We can't shake his hand. How do we keep our mind stayed on someone we cannot see? By staying in God's word. 
by keeping his word at the forefront of my mind. Now, when Stephanie and I were, were barely dating, she lived over in Tulare, and I lived on the very north side of Visalia. So I had to drive an entire city all the way to go see her every single day for two years. If that was a business, I would have had a lot of tax write-offs for gas and deductions. But, I, I mean, I drove pretty much every day to her house. And, or, or I went to her house, picked her up, and came back to my house and then took her back home. It was a drive. But it was a, it was a long, long drive. And, I mean, we saw each other pretty much every day. But the times that we didn't see each other, how did I keep my mind on her? Hey, what are you doing? Do you want to see me tomorrow? Do you want to go to dinner, dinner tomorrow night? And we would have this communication. And then at the end of every single night, we would get our phones and we'd put them on speaker. And we'd be on the phone all night long. And then we'd fall asleep and then wake up and we'd throw on the phone together. And that was our relationship. We always just wanted to be in communication with each other, even when we weren't seeing each other, even when we were apart from each other. And I mean, if, if Jesus had a phone, that would be pretty cool. But he has the word. He has the word. He doesn't need to text you anything. He already texted everyone everything right here and then said, all right, end, period. Don't bother me. Here it is. He already gave, gave us everything we need to know. So how do you stay on him like a relationship, how I stayed on her. My mind stayed on her. We were in constant communication. I thought about her all the time because we were always talking to each other. And this is his way of talking to you. People say, I have a hard time hearing from God. Why? He wrote the whole thing right there. What do you want? You want him to yell from the mountains and scare the whole city just for you? You know, one time I was over at the gas station on Acres and Cyprus. At Flyers, I think it's a Flyers gas station. CVC is right there. Cigna is right there. I was filling up my gas tank one time, and, and I don't even know what day it was or what time it was. I was just filling up my gas, and I wasn't paying attention to anything. I was minding my own business and watching the dollars go up and the gas go up. And this was a few years ago, so gas was still a good price. And then out of nowhere, I was filling it up. I hear this booming loud voice. And it, like, startled me. I almost dropped the thing out of, my, out of the gas part of my car. And it startled me. My heart was pumping. I was, like, looking around, like, what the heck was that? And then I looked over at CVC's football field, and there was a game going on. And it was the, the overhead commentator announcing one of the players. And I just started thinking, man, if that alone startled me, imagine God speaking in a loud, booming voice. How crazy would that be? That was insane. So that put into perspective, all right, Lord, thank you for speaking to me through your word and through your quiet Holy Spirit and not through a loud voice because I would die if I heard something like that. It was just the football thing was loud for me and it scared me. I can't imagine hearing God's giant voice, his Matthew. I can imagine it kind of sounds like mine. I'm created after his own image. <laughs> Vocal cords and all. But you keep your mind on him by reading his word. Standing on the word. Again, putting every thought under the obedience of Christ. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Proverbs 23, I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Again, your life is going the exact way that, that you're thinking. Your, your dominant thought is, is directing the way your life is going. Just like how uh, you can't have a pregnant lady drink this and then have another lady drink it and expect to get pregnant. That's not how it works. I can't piggyback off of someone else's faith. I can't piggyback what Jeff told me yesterday and hope it works for me. I have to plant it in my heart and conceive it in my life. I can't just hear it. I can't just stand next to someone and, and rub some of that anointing on me. I need to have it for myself. You need to have it for yourself. 
This is great. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembly of the church. Don't forsake this. But this isn't enough. It's only once a week for five hours. It's not enough. You need to continue this on your own. After we leave today, you go home, you get the word, you study what, I, what we preached about, find something else to, to study, whatever, just study the word of God. Monday morning comes around, you have work at eight o'clock, get up at six o'clock, get up at six o'clock, read the word from six to seven, make breakfast and go on your day. Get the word in your heart as much as you can. You need to conceive it for yourself. You can't just piggyback off of someone else's experience. If I can have the band come back up. Thank you, Lord. There was a, a time in Jesus's ministry where, in all honest, honesty to, to most people, it would have looked like a failure to the ministry. Imagine this great man of, of, of faith and this great healer. Imagine you heard so-and-so healing minister is coming to town and he heals everybody and he comes and he does his service and you come up for prayer and he lays your hand and not a single person gets healed. Not a single one. Thousands of people coming. Not a single person gets healed. People would consider that a failure. Well, Jesus had a similar experience where he was going back to his hometown he was healing people, casting out devils, preaching, doing the work of the ministry. Then he comes back to his town and he sees the people and the people who said, isn't that Jesus, the carpenter's son? What's he doing over here? Who is he? I saw him when he was 12 years old pretending to preach at the temple. What, what is he doing? And it says in verse 5, he, he could do no mighty work there except lay hands on a few which is more than what most people are doing. Except lay his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. But he couldn't do any mighty work there. Not because Jesus was powerless. Because the people weren't expecting. The people could not get the image. It was his hometown. They couldn't get the image of hometown Jesus out of their head. I'm blessed because I have a family that receives the word from their grandson, from their nephew, from their cousin, from their son, from their son-in-law, from their brother-in-law, from every family relation you can think of, I'm able to minister to them. In most cases, family won't listen to you, let alone you being the younger one. I'm blessed. But the people in his life, they only imagined who he was growing up. Little baby Jesus whose diaper had to be changed. Baby Jesus who probably cried because he was hungry. Who is this guy? Jesus? You're telling me Jesus is the Messiah? No way. You're telling me he can heal? No way. I, know, I knew him when he was 10. I knew him when he was 13 years old, running around the streets. I knew him. There is no way that that little boy can be the Messiah. He could do no mighty work. They didn't conceive the truth. They had a vain imagination. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him. Neither were they thankful. And they had a vain imagination. I'm going to give you one last story. It's about David, King David. Before he was King David, he was shepherd boy David. And in, in uh, 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel chapter 17, the scripture says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. David was standing in front of, the, in front of Goliath. The Bible, people and scholars say that Goliath was somewhere around 12 to 13 feet high. And David was this little shepherd boy, 13-year-old at the most, but this small, standing in front of a Goliath that was probably that big. And he says, surely this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. And all he had on was his, 
is a cloth, maybe a sash, and a little slingshot with five smooth stones. Well, here's Goliath with all of his armor, armor that probably cost a fortune, a sword that probably weighed more than David himself, and his entire Philistine army behind him. And here's David. God will deliver you into my hand. But then he goes on. I want you to look at this. He says, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and I will take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all of the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. What did David do? He imagined this. He said, you know what? I'm not going to just kill you, Goliath. I'm going to slay you, and then I'm going to chop your head off just for good measure. Jump down to verse 48. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried, ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and he struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But... There was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran, stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of his sheath, killed him, and cut off his head with it. He said exactly, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He imagined it, and he set out, and he did it. Then it says, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. I can't, I don't believe this has happened out of chance. David saw exactly what he was going to do in his mind. Then he did it. If you want to remain in joy, you have to conceive in your mind. You have to conceive joy at the beginning. Then you'll birth joy. You'll reap joy. Thank you, Lord. I said I'd give you one more scripture, but I have another one. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 14, it says, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had left him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For the land that, the, for the, all the land which you see, I will give you and your descendants forever. Now, think, just think about this. Can you, use, can you use your brain and your head other than a coat rack for just a, or a hat rack just for one moment? Think about this. God told Abram, Look up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Look as far as you can see, northward, eastward, southward, westward, to all the land you can see. I will give it to you, not just to you, all of your descendants forever. Do you know who you're a descendant from? You're Abraham's seed. I'm Abraham's seed. We are all descendants of Abraham. Now, the human eye can probably only look about eight or nine miles before the curvature of the earth starts to happen. How is it possible for Abraham or Abram at the time to see Visalia, California? I'm not making, the Bible says, God said, I will give you all the land that you can see to you and your descendants forever. We're here today because of Abraham and what he saw. 
If it was only limited to what he could naturally see, we'd be stuck over there in that little tiny place. All eight billion of us would be in that little concentrated place that was limited to his vision. He had to see with something else. He saw in here. But God said, look at the, the, the sand on the ground. Look at the stars in the sky. So shall your seed be. As many people, as many stars that are in the sky, as much sand that's on the ground, those will be the number of your descendants. Abraham needed to rely on something not natural to see all the land that God would give him and his descendants. I hope you're seeing this, the power of the imagination. The last verse I want to give you, Hebrews 11 says, if they would have truly, if they would have called to mind that country from which they came out of, they would have had an opportunity to return. This is talking about Abraham. It's talking about him and Sarah leaving the place that, that they were at, where God said, leave, get out of your tent, leave. If they would have brought back to memory, if they would have remembered where they came from, they would have had the opportunity to return to it. You ever asked yourself, man, I wish we were back in the good old days. Remember the good old days when gas was low, we had a good president, and the economy was, was thriving. Remember the good old days in 1990? Remember the good old days in 2000? Careful, because that might cause you to stop moving forward. You're imagining the past. Start imagining the future. Start using your imagination for what's to come. Let me tell you, church, we're living in the good old days. These are the good old days. Amen? We're going to get to heaven one of these days and go, man, remember the good old days? Remember back in 2010? Remember back in 2020, the good old days? Remember the good old days in 2030? Remember the good old days in 2045? Our entire life, when we get to heaven, will be a good old day. And that day when we're in heaven is going to be the great day, the best day ever. Don't get stuck by imagining the past because it will cause you to not look towards the future and be expecting and be hopeful for what God will do then. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning as we get dismissed. Thank you, Lord. God wants you to dream big. Use that imagination. Don't let fear tell you what to do. Don't conceive fear in your heart. Conceive joy. Conceive the goodness of God. Conceive his word in your heart. Because he wants you to do great things. He wants you to do supernatural things. Amen? Not just natural things. God wants you to go out on a limb because that's where the food grows. That's where the fruit is made, on the limb. Stop hugging the trunk where it's safe and secure. He wants you to go out on the limb and to live a supernatural life that only he can get credit for. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we just thank you for this time we've had together. I thank you for everyone in here and their hearts to receive. I pray for every heart in here that's been limited by fear, limited by by emotion, Lord, limited by the, the fear of what if and the, the not knowing tomorrow. God, right now, I just pray that their imagination will be open and expanded to receive all that you have for them, to start dreaming and believing for the things that you have for their life, Father. This great supernatural life that you've called all of us to live, the abundant life that you came to give us. We, right now, we use our imagination to our advantage. We use our imagination for your good so that you can accomplish things in this life. We can partner with you. We can, we can come alongside with you and do what you want us to do in this life. Father, we thank you for giving us this imagination and we thank you for giving us good things in your words so that we can see things to come in this life in our future. How we love you. We thank you for everyone who is here this morning and all of God's people said.
Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Yeah, give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Thank you, Lord. He is good. You know, we can, we can limit him in our imagination. Take the limits off. Dream big. Think big. Imagine big. Amen. Hey, before we get dismissed, just remember that we have our uh, good friend Arthur Mentions coming uh, in July. Don't, do not miss. It's going to be a good, good time. July 14th through the 16th. It's going to be a good three days of him ministering to us. So I encourage you all to be here if you can. It's going to be a great, great time. Other than that, again, small groups are on hold for now until we let you guys know when we start back up. Um, and, and it's going to be a good time. But until next time, I bless you guys in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I pray whatever you say your hands to do will prosper in Jesus' name. That you remember you're the head and not the tail. You are up front and not lagging behind. You are above always and never beneath in Jesus' name. I pray you continue living in the victory. And remember you are always welcome here in our family of faith. God bless you guys. We'll see you again real soon.